I love my cat so much. <laughs>Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Buchan. I'm a composer, conductor, and music educator here on YouTube. Welcome back to my channel. You're just in time to see the first installment of the Video Companion series, where I'll be talking a little bit about each one of my compositions and diving into more detail about why I wrote them, how I wrote them, any interesting stories behind them, and just any unique musical details that may not be as obvious in the scores or recordings. <laughs> Looks like it's gonna rain in Albuquerque. That happens like what? Five times a year? I don't know. And I featured my three lovely cats in the beginning of this video because we're gonna be talking about none other than Trio of Cats, a new work for Chamber Winds. So this piece has the honor of being the very first completed musical composition that I wrote during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's in part because of, well, two reasons really. One, especially at the beginning of this pandemic, I was feeling so much anxiety and just a whole bunch of uncertainty behind what the hell is going to be happening here in the future. And to an extent, I still feel that way a little bit. And I use composition and arranging to process those feelings, to work through them in a healthy way and in a way that you know, spits out some music at the end that people can try. Two, I also use my lovely three cats, Binks, Lily, and Eddie, as fur therapy. Because anybody who has pets will tell you, pets are wonderful, usually. So, I decided to write a piece that was inspired by each one of them, and each cat has its own unique movement to represent their own unique personality. So, let's dive into it. So as we can see, this piece has a pretty small ensemble. One flute, one oboe, three clarinets, one bassoon, three horns, two trumpets, and a bass. Twelve players, pretty intimate setting. And this first movement starts with a nice little motor theme that we have in the clarinets, with the first trumpet picking up the main melody. Now that melody is answered by this motive in the flute, a chromatically descending minor third. That's actually based off of a particular meow that Binks does when he's pining for cat grass. So that's sort of the reasoning behind this. It doesn't sound exactly like this, but it's pretty dang close. From here, it's pretty straightforward the melody unfolds with more iterations of the meow theme. Then we get a little bit more of the ensemble added in here with some more counter melody with some staccato eighth notes. That goes on for a little while and then we have this B section in the middle with some more melodic development action in the woodwinds as well as the first trumpet. And then we get this big climax here with everybody joining in before we get into this little codetta. Now, if you're performing this piece, make sure that this part right here in the third horn gets brought out, as well as the first clarinet. Those are things that can really be lugubrious and have a nice cadence to the final iteration of the melody. We get a little bit of a different timbre here. Clarinet has the melody, horn has the meow theme, and that keeps going for a little while. The rest of it's pretty straightforward. Melody develops in the woodwinds, we have the meow theme going on in all of the other instruments that gets tighter and tighter and tighter and more compact until we end with this beautiful G major chord here at the end. So then we get to the middle movement here, the intermezzo, named after our one female cat, Lily. This was actually the first of the three movements that I had finished, but after all three were composed, I really heard it as the middle movement of the three, and so it was hence named the intermezzo. We start with just the double bass, the bassoon, and the clarinets, with first clarinet carrying the melody here. That's pretty straightforward, nice and light throughout all of this. There's not too much more that needs to be explained by this. Just making sure that the melody can pop out and all these lovely counter melodies can come out in whatever voices may be happening at the time. We have a lovely horn solo right here in the middle. And then this big build up with this nice little rhythmic background in the 
Woodwinds with the double bass having the melody here and with a nice finish to this first section with a repeat which you may or may not do depending on how long you want to play this. And then we get to the B section with the relative minor from F major to oh no no not relative parallel minor. I know my music theory. <laughs> We get a little bit more motivic development that keeps going and going for a little while. This nice little horn texture with the double bass and bassoon melody. This does get a little sparse, but that's very intentional. I didn't want this to be super thick all the time. We'll get more of that later, trust me. We get this nice little build up going back into F major with an almost exact repeat of the beginning, but not quite, because the ending gets a little bit truncated for a nice little concert finish. And then we get to the final movement of the three, the Scherzo, named after none other than our lovely orange terror, Eddie. I say terror, he's really actually very adorable, but the thing about him is that he has a tendency to, well, break stuff and scratch where he's not supposed to and just in general be a curious cat whatever that may mean to you unlike the other two movements this one is quite fast something important to note only in this movement the flute player is going to have to switch to piccolo towards the end same thing with the third clarinet switching to e flat clarinet towards the end as well i'll get to why in a minute this beginning starts pretty soft and it builds very gradually but the rhythm is super important in here the rhythm and articulation that gets its nice little pop and bite and character the real melody actually starts right about here with the first First and second clarinet. Now notice here that it's actually broken between the two voices, that it's not played by one player. And that's actually the case for most of this piece, at least in the fast sections. This first iteration here is just with three players, and then we get a little bit more. And then the first and second trumpet have it with background action going on with these fast flurries of 16th notes. We get all this nice buildup here going into a key change into concert C major. Same thing here with the oboe and the flute. I like to get this sort of comic feel. That's why you get all of this like back and forth action going on. We get another key change here and this time it's a duet with none other than the double bass and the bassoon. I wanted to give our double bass player some love because typically they don't get a lot of solos and this is a nice little texture that really brings it out especially in this nice high thumb position with this nice build up going into a quarter time section. Now this is where the textures really start shifting. This melody here in the first trumpet is actually the same exact melody that we had in the beginning, just four times as slow. And instead of being spread around between more than one player, this is squarely a solo here. It is changed slightly towards the end to give it a nice cap, but it's basically the same. We get the same thing happening in the oboe with an echo in the horn. Watch for this lovely high C here. You're going to have to have a really awesome horn player to really bring that out. Not too loud. Same thing with this high F in the oboe. And then we have the double bass giving this backbeat pizzicato action. This builds up and builds up. And then we get this big corral here with the brass and the double bass with lots of flurries in the woodwinds. Nice and long here. Bach, but with a little bit more whimsy. All the way here, nice big cadence finishing off. This is where our flute player is gonna have to switch to piccolo, and then we immediately go back to this more staccato, popping, bouncing, bubbly style. We think we're gonna get into the next section, but that's more of a false start. The clarinets here are the ones that really bring us into the new section. The melody gets reintroduced by the oboe and the piccolo with some more back and forth between some other instruments. I love this third horn feature here. This, this does not need to be pretty by any means. In fact, I almost wanted to emulate a foghorn right here. So don't 
worry about it being super pretty. It's not supposed to be. We get this next transition here, more motivic development. This is where we start featuring our E-flat clarinet player here. And then we get to the climax of the piece where we really just go ham with the chromaticism here. So this back and forth between the piccolo and E-flat clarinet is really supposed to be one line here. I just wanted to break it up so that they give some chance to breathe. See if about getting that as fluid as possible between the two players. Same thing with this scale Euler figure that we have bounced around between the first clarinet, second clarinet, and oboe. And while that's going on, we have the melody again transformed chromatically by the trumpets and by the horns with this big buildup and this fully diminished chord here. A nice transition back into our starting key of G major. Now notice here, the entire melody, it's spread around between every single person in the ensemble. So this is going to be really, really important to track together. This octave displacement also contributing to the comic feel. We get this huge crescendo from pianissimo to fortissimo with a home run finish to the end. And that's the piece. Thank you all so very much for listening. If you want to take a listen to the full work now, I've posted a link floating around somewhere in the screen as well as in the description box below. If you liked this video, please give it a like, hit that subscribe button, and tune in next week for the next installment of the Video Companion series. Bye now!